Well, if you have your Bibles, we're gonna get straight to it this morning. I hope you're bringing this with you or maybe you bring an iPad or you use an app on your iPhone or if you have an iPhone or any Android people in here today. Yeah, you guys are the green, the green text people. Uh, whatever you're using, let's turn right now to Esther chapter six. This is a huge turning point in our series, a huge turning point in the story. And as you're gonna see this morning, this is incredibly timely in light of everything that we are seeing in the world today. When we turn on the news, we feel it, we sense it. The world is shaking. Do you guys feel that? We open social media, we open the newspaper, This is a pivotal time in history. This is a pivotal time in the book of Esther. You see, I believe that God has us in this book for such a time as this. In my mind, this is evidence of God's providence, evidence of God's perfect timing. God is with us, ushering us through, personally, a a church in Lemoore through a crazy time in the world. Scoot this over. You see, it's no coincidence that we're studying a book in the Bible centered around a plot to annihilate the Jewish people while simultaneously on every news station in the world, a similar plot is unfolding today. In week one of our series, we talked explicitly about the problem of anti-Semitism. We talked about a man named Haman and his his. His name actually means wrath. Hama means poison, wrath, hatred. He was a man of wrath who would do anything he could to annihilate the Jewish people. And he actually set a plan in in motion that would annihilate every Jew in all of Persia. We also mentioned that this was not the first time, nor would it be the last time that something terrible like this would happen. In fact, Jesus says that in the last days, things will actually get harder in Israel. Jesus says this in Matthew 24, verse four, he answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ, and they'll lead many astray. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines. There will be earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. When we launched our study in Esther, we could have never predicted how Haman's fury would foreshadow that of Hamas terrorists. We could have never anticipated that the very setting of our book, Susa of Persia, located in modern day Iran, is the very place supplying weapons and resources to terrorists in Gaza. I point this out only because as we've been going through Esther, some may read this book and think, surely this is just a fairy tale. No one is really that full of hatred and that full of poison that they would try to annihilate an entire entire people group. Surely this is just a story meant to teach some good lessons. We are living in 2023. We're far more sophisticated than that. Surely no one today would do what we're seeing in the book of Esther. And then you turn on the news. And what do you see? Families kidnapped. Women women raped, children slaughtered, and people rejoicing and dancing in the streets. What we know about Israel is that it's always been a powder keg facing the heat of belligerent rulers and fanatical terrorists. That's, That's been Israel for many, many decades. And I'm pointing this out 
Because I believe that times like the times we're living in today reveal the worst of humanity. Anybody agree with that this morning? I know that we jumped right into it this morning. But there's a lot going on in the world. And we can either put our heads in the sand and just try to ignore everything and just hope, you know, we live in this little bubble and hopefully our bubble never breaks, but that's not reality. Jesus calls us to be lights to the world. Jesus calls us to be a part of change. We see things like human trafficking. We put our foot down and we stand against it. That's why we're going to take on that cause in 2024 as one of our new missions. We see things like hap- what's happening in Israel. That's why we add them to our Thanksgiving offering. We see that there's a need for a, a healthy church in the Antelope Valley and reaching people who are displaced and, and not worshiping anywhere. And that was, so we go out and we're trying to m- meet a need there. We have people like Katrina here who goes to places like Kenya. And I'm going to go to Kenya in February and try to help with those who need education and help provide food and clothing and, and, and fight back against the worst things that we see in humanity. And right now is one of those times where we see the worst of humanity. We see it on social media as people blatantly support evil and propagate lies. We see it on the news as we watch disturbing un- events replayed repeatedly in front of our eyes. We feel it in our pockets as life becomes more expensive and overwhelming. And in moments like these, we cannot help but ask ourselves, is evil winning? You guys ever feel like that? The story of Esther asks a very similar question. You see, up to this point in the story, Things have not gone particularly well for Esther, Mordecai, or the Jewish exiles. Esther won a beauty pageant, making her the queen of Persia, but so far her power had gained her nothing. She was an absent queen living with one foot in the world and one foot in the faith, and and she didn't even know what was happening in her kingdom until she was finally challenged to do something, and she stepped into her role as a queen. And and so we've been seeing that in the previous chapters, but up to there, then things were not going well. Uh, Similarly, her cousin Mordecai, He saved the king, King Xerxes, from assassination. But instead of being rewarded, he was overlooked for a promotion. And his greatest enemy, Haman the Horrible, was exalted instead. And Haman took the beef that he had with Mordecai and the Jewish people, and he poured it out on all the Jews and all the kingdom by convincing the king to enact a law ensuring genocide, to annihilate men, women, and children of the Jewish people heritage all around Persia. And so if you were to map out this story visually, it looks something like this. Have you guys ever heard of a, a chiasm in, a, in you know, writing stories or poetry? This is, it has a chiastic s- structure. So it begins with everything is great for the Persians. Xerxes is great. Persia is great. Mordecai is overlooked. Haman is exalted. Haman goes and he wants to kill the Jews and he, 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 gets, he rolls the dice and he gets the king to, to side with him and, and everything is going downhill and it's not a good story for the Jewish people. It's actually a sad story and Esther is absent and then she's challenged to do something. And so she begins to discover her calling and decide to be all in instead of lukewarm. And so she sets up a banquet, but just as she's setting up a banquet to ask the king for something, Haman is setting up a uh, a stake. He's he's setting up the gallows to to hang Mordecai. That's where we ended last week when my, my buddy, Pastor Matt, was out here preaching. He talked about Haman's plan to kill Mordecai, he puts a stake at the top of the highest wall in the city, about 70 feet high. And when it talks about gallows in this book, we're not talking about a noose around somebody's neck. We're talking about literally either impaling them on a stake or nailing them to a stake. This was the, this was the, the, the nation that invented crucifixion. The Persians started crucifixion. The Romans uh, perfected crucifixion. And so Haman has this idea of getting rid of his enemy by putting him on this stake at the top of the wall over the city. Everything is going downhill. It doesn't look like God is doing anything to help his people until you get to chapter six and everything begins to turn around. But so far, the wicked have been winning. The godly seem to be losing. 
And maybe you feel that sometimes. God, where are you? Will you vindicate me? Will you vindicate your people? And in chapter five, Pastor Matt shared how Queen Esther had initiated this risky plan to save her people. It looked like things were gonna turn around, but just as her plan began, Haman formed his own plan to kill Mordecai by impaling him on a stake high above the city, up on the city walls. Things were not going well, but today is a turning point. I know that we started in the thick of it this morning, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> We got heavy right away. So I'm gonna pray, and I have a lot of hope to share with you this morning, but we needed to begin with reality. Let's pray and jump into it. Father God, remind us today that divine silence is not divine absence. Remind us today That when it seems like things are going downhill, whether it's our lives or whether it's downhill in the world, you will vindicate your people. You will fight for your people. Give us patience to trust you. Give us love to, to love you and to love others, to pray for others, to pray even for our enemies, to to show the love and the grace of Jesus Christ in this world. And help us to trust that even when your name seems to be nowhere, your fingerprints are everywhere. And you, Lord Jesus, you are a God of divine reversals. You are the God who turns everything around. You are the God who it seems one day that things are going in one direction and the next everything changes. You are the God who were, you were in a tomb and three days later you resurrected to sit at the right hand of God the Father. And I just pray that we would see that you can reverse anything in our lives. Help us trust you this morning. I pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said. So I wanna give you guys three reasons you can trust God to reverse your fate. Does that sound like good news? Three, three reasons you can trust God to, to reverse when your life feels like it's going like this or when the world feels like it's going like this. Three reasons you could trust God to turn things around. Reason number one is this. You can trust God to turn things around because God's timing is always perfect. You guys believe that this morning? Listen to how this passage begins. Esther, let's start in verse 14 of chapter five. Then his wife, Zeresh, this is Haman's wife, and all his friends said to him, let a gallows 50 cubits high be made and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it, impaled upon it or or nailed to it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. And this idea, it pleased Haman and he had the gallows made. So we ended last week with Haman. He doesn't like Mordecai. He wants to get rid of him. He's about to go to bed. His wife says, here's a plan. Get him killed tomorrow. Haman's like, what a great idea. So he goes to bed excited. He wakes up early the next morning to get the king to enact his plan. But that night, the king experiences something unique as well. On that night, chapter six, verse one, the king, he couldn't sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Big Thana and Teresh. I I like that name. I wonder if he has, you know, a little Thana in his family or medium Thana. Um, Two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. All of a sudden he's reading about this time where somebody he knew planned to assassinate him. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? This this Jewish guy who saved me. What, what did we do for him? The king's young men who attended him said, well, we've done nothing for him. And the king said, well, who's in the court? So king's up early. He, he needs to make this right. Well, now Haman had just entered the court. Haman had his own plan. The king is forming another plan. He came into the court of the king's palace to speak to the king about getting Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Now, do uh, any of you ever struggle falling asleep at night? Anybody in here? Yeah, like half of you, man, yeah. That's why you're 11 o'clock service people, right? Um, 
What, what do you do when you struggle to fall asleep? Do you, maybe you, you read a book. Maybe you read a boring book. I don't know. Maybe you cuddle your dog or your cat. Maybe you scroll through Instagram, which is, by the way, is a terrible idea. If you want to stay up all night, look at Instagram. Uh, maybe you take a melatonin gummy. I mean, I just discovered those things. Uh, whoever made those needs a statue or an award of some kind. Um, well, after an intriguing banquet with Queen Esther, King Xerxes, or he, that's his Greek name, King Ahasuerus is his Persian name. He has this banquet. Esther hasn't made a request yet. He's just kind of, she's just kind of setting the, the, the scene to make this big request for her people. But he goes to bed that night and he finds himself unable to sleep. He's tossing, he's turning, doesn't know what to do. And, and this is kind of interesting because you got to remember, this is a pagan king. He's a pagan king. He has many wives. He has a full harem. Okay, if he's up late and he can't sleep, there are lots of other things that he could have been doing. And most kings, when they are up late, they would be doing some of those naughty things. He has all the best wine. He has lots of different ways. This is a pagan. He's not worshiper of Yahweh. Lots of different ways he could have amused himself. But instead, for some reason, he sends somebody to go get a book, a book called the Book of the Chronicles. Okay, this, this is a book that will put you to sleep. It's like reading board minutes, okay? If you ever read those before. It was an official record of the Persian kings in which every official transaction that, of the court was recorded. It was the official transcript the king would draw up uh, and he'd use this to figure out who would be rewarded for faithful service and, and who would be punished for disobedience, who would be hung on the gallows and who would be honored. Because when people do good things in the kingdom, when they get honored, it shows everybody, hey, I want you to be like this guy. When they get crucified on the gallows, it says, hey, don't be like that guy. This was a cruel way of ruling, but it's what they did in Persia. Well, on that night, the king's servant goes and gets the book of Chron the Chronicles, opens them up, and he just so happens to open up to an event from five years prior where a Jew named Mordecai saved the king from an assassination plot. And so the king said in verse three, what did we do for this guy? What honor has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended him said, well, actually nothing. We didn't do anything for this guy. So this mortified the king. He, he's like, he wakes up early the next day ready to do something about it. But who also is waking up early the next day ready to do something about Mordecai? Haman. The king wakes up. He's seeking advice on what to do, how to honor this man Mordecai. Haman hurries off, wakes up, goes to the court, seeking to talk to the king about how to hang Mordecai. What I want you to see is something that I don't want you to take for granted in this series, and I don't want you to take it for granted in your life. And it's this. Esther may not be a book of miracles, but it is still a book of wonders. Esther doesn't contain a single miracle in the book. We studied Daniel last year around this time. We saw miracle after miracle. We saw people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survive the fiery furnace. We saw Daniel survive the pit of lions. If you read your Bible, you know of miracles. The crossing of the Red Sea in Exodus. The, the tumbling of the walls in Jericho. God often moves through miracles. But sometimes, more frequently, more commonly, God just moves through miracles regular events. And in this case, the walls of Jericho didn't come down. God moved through a sleepless night. How basic is that? He uses sleepless nights to accomplish his will. The title of our series is God's Hidden Presence because Esther is the only book in the entire Bible that never mentions God's name, not even once. But his fingerprints are everywhere. Not a single miracle, but it's a book of wonders. And I think it's because that's how God commonly works. 
You see, many of you here today probably haven't seen a miracle. I'm not, I'm saying, some of you probably have. Most of you probably haven't. But I'm sure you can attest to the fact that God comes through at just the perfect time. God, you've seen God's providence and you've seen God's sovereignty. Anybody see that in their lives? Surely you have seen God show up at just the right moment in just the right way because his timing is always perfect. Amen. Can I get an amen from anyone this morning? God's timing is always perfect. And so when your life is going down like this, when the world is going down like this and your life looks like the structure of Esther, know that God always comes through at just the right time. My grandpa David, he was a pastor. He's a godly man. And when he was discipling me, he would always say this to me. He would always say, God is rarely early, but always on time. And I'm like, why can't he be early? <laughs> Why can't it be now or yesterday? How long did Mordecai wait for his reward? How long did Mordecai wait to finally be recognized for saving the king's life? How long did he wait? Five years. God is rarely early, but he's always on time. And even the most casual events in our lives are connected to God's purpose for us. He's at work in the tiny details. Esther records that on that night, the king couldn't sleep. It was that night, the night Haman was planning to kill Mordecai, that the king recalled an event from five years earlier, the night of before Mordecai's execution. Mordecai was a man who had been overlooked for five years. His enemy was plotting his demise, but on that night, night, God had another plan. Here we see hope for the overlooked. Have you ever been overlooked? I know I have. Misunderstood, criticized, overlooked, gossiped about, experienced hatred. You probably felt the same thing. And, and you if you ever felt like me, it's like sometimes you feel, God, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to respond correctly. I'm trying to be in your will. And for some reason, I just keep getting beat up in the process. And I'm trying to do what's right. Why? Are, where are you? May, anybody ever feel that before? Overlooked. What matters is that you do right even when it's hard. Mordecai did the right thing by stepping out. He was overlooked. He was forgotten. But you know who did see? God saw. You know who does see your life and the things that maybe your parents are overlooking in your life or your friends are overlooking in your life or your school, or your classmates or your teachers or, or, or your pastor or whatever. The others may overlook things in your life. God sees it all. And he will reward you and he will vindicate you and he will fight for you because his timing is always perfect. He's rarely early, but he's what? Always on time. Which leads to point number two. When evil is winning, remember that God laughs at the plans of the wicked. Not because their plans are funny, but because they really think that they could overcome him. And that's funny. Listen to verse five. And the king's young men told him, Haman, he's out in the court. You need help figuring out what to do for this guy, Mordecai? He, he came early to talk to you. So Haman came in and the king said to him, hey, Haman, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? He doesn't say the man's name. <laughs> Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? What do we know about Haman? Haman loves him some what? <laughs> he loves him some Haman, right? You heard that from Pastor Matt last week. 
Haman's like, oh, this is my moment, right? He's, he already has the job. He already has the place of honor, but now he wants to be treated like a king. And so he's like, this is the time the king wants to do something really special. So I'm gonna tell him what I want so that I get it. It's like my wife, by the way, uh, for Christmas and her birthday, she uh, just sends me an Amazon list. Because <laughs> she's like, I don't trust you what you're gonna get me. Just get what I send you. Um, I don't know, that's probably a bad thing on my part, but <laughs> Haman get, makes his Amazon list. This is what I want. Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought to him, which the king has worn. And the horse, man, that horse that the king has ridden and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor. Let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. That's what you should do, king. And then the king said to Haman, great idea. Hurry off, take the robes, get the horse, do as you've said, and do it to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Okay, I'm happy that you guys are laughing because this, this is supposed to be comedy, all right? If you don't think that God has a sense of humor, then you are not understanding what's happening in these verses. Okay, this is divine reversal. Hurry, go do this for Mordecai. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned so Haman, Haman takes the robes, gets the horse, dresses Mordecai, his enemy, leads him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Okay, this is arguably the most ironically comic scene in the entire Bible. I will just tell you, God has a sense of humor Okay, Haman was plotting Mordecai's death, but instead he secured Mordecai's reward. He was this unsuspecting man entering the king's court and he trips over his own pride, thinking that he would be honored and instead his enemy is honored. And if ever there was a picture of pride going before the fall, Haman is it. <laughs> okay, pride goes before what? The fall. And a haughty spirit before what? destruction. King Solomon says it this way. He says, the hopes of the righteous, they bring joy, but the expectations of the wicked, they perish. If you have evil plans, your evil plans may work for a season, but they will eventually lead to your own ruin. That's true of everybody who plots evil. Everybody who plots evil. They may succeed in a moment. They may succeed for a time, but their own plans will become the, own, the source of their own ruin. What makes the book of Esther so beautiful is that the plans of the wicked become the source of their own destruction. Alistair Begg, he says it this way. He says, the purpose of God is brought about by those whose only view is to fulfill their own purpose. Haman has an evil purpose. God turns it around and uses it for good. Haman wants to destroy Mordecai. Instead, he's forced to honor him, to walk him through the street and say, thus shall it be to the man who the king delights in. And how awkward must that have been? Okay, they've had beef this whole time. And if, if I were Mordecai, I would be relishing in this moment. I'd be like, hey man, say that thing again. Do it again. Like, <laughs> hey, we're in my town. Like, I want my parents to hear this. Get it nice and loud this time. Nice and loud. Hey, how's my robe looking? Does it look okay? You know, like, this was his moment, right? This was the time for him to, to relish in God's providence. What I want you to see is there's no such thing as a coincidence with God. The evil, they attempt to wrestle with God, but they'll always lose. God laughs. He says in Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. God laughs. Haman hurried off early in the morning to impale Mordecai on a stake 70 feet high above the city, likely built on the city walls as a, as a statement for everybody. But instead of exalting him on a stake, he is exalted. He's lifted up and placed on a horse and honored around town. And that, that's just funny. Mordecai got the reward that Haman wanted. This makes me think of something funny I saw this week. Any of you guys uh, watched the 49ers-Cowboys game this last Sunday? Yeah. I, any Cowboys fans in here, by the way? All right, don't, don't hate me. Um, I, so I'm not a 49ers fan or a Cowboys fan. I, I, love, I do love watching football. And I always, you know, I'm always hopeful for the Cowboys because it's always like, this is their year. This is it. This is it. Like Dak is doing his thing and, and the, the defense is killer this year and, and everything's looking great. And look at how many points they're putting up. And then, you know, at the big games, every time it's a big game, what happens to them boys? They just start to fall apart. And I'm, I'm a Rams fan, okay? So I, you know, and yes, thank you. And I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm hurting because the, the Eagles put it on the Rams last week and Annie let me know over and over again. And, uh, but after the 49ers game, I watched it with some people after church and, and I'm just watching this game and, and you have Mr. Irrelevant and you have Dak Prescott and, and Brock Purdy should not be winning these games, but look at what he's doing. And he goes out there and he puts all these points on the board and and, and, and I was there with Niner fans and one Cowboy fan, and I just couldn't help but laugh. I'm sorry. And then I went on my uh, Instagram that night, and I came across this meme. And then I just laughed even harder. <laughs> you got Dak getting carried by Mr. Irrelevant. This guy should not be an elite quarterback, but he's becoming one of the best in the league. And, and, and I'm just showing you that because I, I think memes are kind of funny. And Esther chapter six, I think is God's way of posting a meme. So that's why I thought I'd show you that today. Which leads to my final point. We know that God's timing is always perfect, amen? We know that God laughs at the plans of the wicked, amen? We also know the final point. God's plans can never be stopped. Verse 12, this is what it says. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. He'd been walking out in town, had a great morning, being honored. He wasn't even looking for that. He just like was told, get on the horse. He's like, sweet. So he did his thing, goes back to the king's gate. Haman hurries home. He's got to get ready for a banquet that night. What's he doing? He's mourning. His head is covered. Haman tells his wife, Zeresh, who encouraged him to put the gallows up, all the friends who also encouraged him, and he tells them what happened to him. They're looking at him like, dude, that's bad. Then his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you've begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, if he worships Yahweh, if God is really on his side, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Esther 6 is what you call a divine reversal. The title of my sermon today is A Reversing of Fate. Because the man who was once exalted, Haman, is now humiliated. The man who once caused weeping throughout the kingdom is now weeping and disgraced himself. The man whose wicked plan seemed impossible to stop is now facing his own demise. Even Haman's wife senses that an irresistible power, an irresistible person is behind the scenes protecting the Jewish people. And beneath all of the surface of all the human decisions, there is this unseen, uncontrollable, powerful force, person at work. His name is Yahweh. He is God of heaven and earth. His ways can't be thwarted. His plans can't be stopped. Regardless of 
how circumstances appear. He is ruling over all of history. All of history is headed in the direction of, of his divine purpose. He is great and powerful and mighty, and he's moving even without miracles. He's moving through ordinary events. The ordinary events of billions of human lives are being affected through, um, through millennia of time to accomplish his eternal purposes and his ancient promises. Karen Jobs, a commentator, says God delivered an entire race of people in Persia because the king had a sleepless night. It stopped genocide because a man wouldn't bow to a superior because a woman found herself taken to the bedroom of a ruthless man for a night of pleasure. How inscrutable are the ways of the Lord? You see, God works through even the hard stuff. God works through even the times that we don't understand. God works even through lukewarm people. God works even when it looks like evil is winning. What does Joseph say when he's sold by his brothers and he eventually saves all of Egypt and saves all of his family? He says to them in Genesis 50, what you meant for evil, God meant for what? Good. That's the God we worship. The God who makes all things new. The God who rules over all of history. The God who, when we feel our lives going down, he can step in and turn everything around. And here's the thing. Here's what I'm trying to challenge us with in Esther. There are people here today who know this about God, but they are still not all in. Today's the day where you finally need to say, God, I am done doing things my way. The plans of the evil, they never work. The rebellious path that you're walking it's going to end in destruction. Those areas in your life where you're saying, you know what, I'm not ready to obey there, it'll come back to bite you. Those areas in your life where you're saying, well, maybe this doesn't apply to me, God's going to show you otherwise. Those things in your life that you're pushing down, you're not talking about, you're continuing in your ways, your wicked ways, your sinful ways, your broken ways. You know this thing has trapped you. You know you need to put this thing aside. You know you need to make that confession. You know you need to turn things around. You know you need something different, but you keep doing the same things and expecting a different outcome. God is trying to show us, look it, I could turn everything around, but you have to lay your life down and trust me completely. Today's the day to do that. The world is shaking. Maybe your life is shaking. God's the one who goes, takes this and turns it around. I don't know what needs to be turned around in your life, but I know where turnaround begins. It begins by believing in Jesus Christ. Receiving him as your savior, which means you trust that he did what was necessary for your salvation. Receiving him as your Lord, which means I'm gonna do what you say. You say, go make disciples, I'm gonna make disciples. You say, don't do this, I'm not gonna do it. You say, be kind to others, I'm gonna be kind. You will say, pray for my enemies. You say, be, be joyfully, courageously gen generous, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do what, what I'm gonna make disciples. I'm, I'm gonna trust you. You say, don't live this idolatrous lifestyle. I'm gonna surrender it. I'm gonna leave it behind. You say, whatever you want, you are now Lord. Is Jesus your Lord and your savior? Not just your savior, okay? If, if Jesus is not your Lord also, then you are not truly saved. S salvation comes from acknowledging him as both. Okay, guess who else knows that Jesus is a savior, the savior of the world? Guess who else knows that? Satan and demons. They know that Jesus is savior, but do they follow him as Lord? No. Is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your savior? What we see in this story is that we can face threatening circumstances with hope, 
If Jesus is our Lord, if Jesus is our Savior, then the Almighty is on our side. Our lives can be turned around. The things that trap us, the things that hurt us can be redeemed for good. The path of joy sometimes, you know, goes through the swamps of suffering and despair, but God always gets us to where we need to go. His timing is perfect. We can trust him. We just have to believe. So let me give you three takeaways this morning. Number one is trust God's timing even when he seems delayed. That is so hard for us to do. I get it. It's so hard when we're going through something like, God, when are you gonna show up? When are you gonna turn this around? God has not forgotten you. It took five years for Mordecai's story to turn around. I don't know how long it might take for you in your story to turn around, but God is teaching you something in the pressure and in the silence and in the pain. And divine silence does not mean divine absence. Trust that his timing is perfect, even when you want it now and he seems delayed. Trust that he'll come through at just the right time. Number two, do what's right, even when no one's looking. Mordecai did the right thing. No one saw it, or so he thought. Five years later, he gets his reward. That's our job as Christians doing the right thing, even when we're not rewarded for it, even when we're not praised for it, even when no one seems to see it, parents don't see it, others don't see it. We know who sees it, God sees it. And he will always come through for us and reward us at the proper time. Humble yourselves under his mighty hand and at the proper time, he'll exalt you. And number three, be clothed in Christ, even if you are living in rags. Mordecai in this book, Last time we saw him, he was at the king's gate wearing what? Do you guys remember? Sackcloth and ashes, like a burlap sack. Then God steps in and he takes the burlap sack from off of his body, the itchy, dirty clothing, clears his face of all his weeping and crying and clothes him with a robe and he gets walked through the city. That is the king's reward. I know of a better king, a greater king who rewards all of his servants who takes off their rags and replaces them with the riches of his glory, the robe of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. That's the king you and I serve. And so if you're living in rags today and your life is filthy and you find yourself weeping and you find yourself broken and you find yourself scarred by sin and marred by a broken world living in rags, you can't approach the Lord with those rags. You have to be cleaned up. The unrighteousness, it stains us. Jesus takes our rags clothes us, robes us with his righteousness and he makes us new and he gives us a future and he gives us a hope and he takes what's broken and he turns it around for his glory. That is the gospel message. Some of you need to replace your rags for the robe today. Today is the day of salvation. And so after this message, if today you sense that today I need to receive the Lord Jesus and I need to be all in and I need to leave my old clothing, I need to put on Christ, put away the old and put on the new, Jesus came to do that for you. If you need that today, we're gonna be up here available to pray with you this morning. And I would encourage you, don't leave without taking that step. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for being with us. I thank you for South Valley for uh, being a place where um, we can talk about hard things and we can address hard topics. And, and Lord, I just pray that we would not be afraid of truth, but that we would also be uh, speaking truth in love. We know that you are gracious and mighty and powerful and, and you vindicate uh, your, your servants and that the plans of the wicked will not ever win. And so we just trust you this morning. Bless us. Be with us as we leave this place, I pray in Jesus' name.